there are many things that connect Japan and India. And within this one lecture, it would be rather difficult to contain all these things. But I'm sure you would be able to catch some of the trajectories that I would like to suggest. The point I want to make is this, that India and Japan has a long-standing partnership. But somehow, within the Japanese mind and within the Indian mind, this connection is a little hazy and some of it is lost. So I want to explore some of these areas that are lost and some of these areas which are visible. So over the centuries, my thesis is this, that over the centuries, India and Japan has, they have created different kinds of partnerships. They begin with the spiritual, move to bilateral and educational, and then go into the strategic as today. From the point of view of a Japanese or Japanese people generally, India is chaotic. In fact, everybody thinks India is chaotic, like a beehive. That's a metaphor that we could perhaps use. The bees are all, all moving very fast, and we don't know where they are going. But they are doing something with a purpose, and they have a plan. India is like that. <clears throat> Japan is like a combustion engine. It's very meticulous, beautifully organized, and it moves without stopping. So both these countries are naturally drawn to each other, often surprised by the power each exhibits. And obviously, the expectations between these two countries, the beehive and the engine, will obviously be quite different, though there is fascination, but there is also difference. Over the years that I've studied about India and Japan, many Japanese tell me that we are doing a lot for and with India. The Indians say, we wish they did a little bit more. So this kind of mismatch <clears throat> in perception that exists even today is the beauty of the relationship and the tension of the relationship and the expectation of the relationship. We should not see it negatively but positively. So with this kind of background, the more I see, the more I see uh, there is, the connection goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Let's talk about the partnership. We are talking about partnership. <clears throat> what is a partnership and what is an alliance? A partnership is an unwritten attraction and contact between cultures and nations. There is business, there is economy, people moving, traveling, things are happening, but there is no fixed dimension. There is no fixed rule how it should happen. So, one of the most important partnerships is the cultural partnership. We have academic, bilateral, strategic. But a cultural partnership is to do with the spiritual, is to do with the cultural traditions of India and Japan. And over the centuries, how they have enriched each other and how each has learned from the other. In the beginning, India is an older civilization. Japan 
received many of the ideas and values from India. We also have an academic partnership, which is of recent origin. And I've been involved in a lot of these academic partnerships since the last 25 years. Exchange between individuals and institutions. Exchange of knowledge and individuals to, to develop a human network and perhaps promote better understanding between the two countries. I have seen many Japanese students who have gone to India, especially to study at St. Stephen's College in Delhi, which was set up by the Cambridge Brotherhood in 1881, to, to learn Indian philosophy, Indian culture. Indian science, Indian language, and English. So they come back after three weeks. To, be, to begin with, we had a three weeks program with them in February, mid February, coming, coming back in March. After these three weeks, weeks some students wish to go back again to study for one year as, as self financed students. And after they stay in the dormitory, they eat the food in the in the dining hall, in the mess, and they live with the students, they study with the students who are Indians. And they pick up lots of techniques and methods of study and motivations. But above all, they make good friends. And this friendship is very valuable because they go back to the country again and again. And some of them come to Japan because of their encouragement to study Japanese. We have a program running with Keio University, especially Shonan Fujisawa campus. <clears throat> and many students went last year, went this year. And some of them who went last year, returned back to St. Stephen's to study for one year. And I can see that their lives have changed. They have become more open to new cultures and their ability to comprehend the universe, to comprehend society has also undergone a very positive and dramatic change. We have another kind of partnership, a bilateral partnership, which kind of benefits both the nations, society, industry, economy. It kind of connects with the interest of both, both countries. And the government sometimes helps, but you have to find, individual companies have to find the areas of interest, partners, and how to connect. So it's a little bit more tricky and difficult. <clears throat> a strategic partnership is a long-term political, economic and social partnership and has a little bit more formal approach to it. it and the embassies and ambassadors and various other people uh, of different countries, they connect. It's top-down and a lot of top-down has a lot of power, but often it needs encouragement from below and it needs constant push so that people can, can complete the job. Many times big projects remain in limbo. They don't move because the people who made it are no longer there and some new people come. So you have to begin often from scratch. So an alliance and a partnership. alliance has a promise. It moves, it works. A partnership is, is, is kind of less formal. It is all the time moving, doing something. It's exciting, but it is not so well organized and planned. A student might go and study at St. Stephen's College because there is a general partnership, general agreement. But it is created for him and for him alone. 
Next year, somebody else wants to go. Another partnership has to be created. But if there is an MOU, a memorandum of undertaking between two universities, that we will take one student from you and one student you will take from us every year, this much we will give. This is the terms and conditions. This would be a written document which would be signed by both the parties, by the directors, by the vice chancellors. <coughs> And people have to uphold, both the institutions have to uphold this kind of undertaking. So alliance and partnership exist. Alliance is a little bit more, more uh, formal, you can say. And partnership is less formal. So Japan and India share a partnership which is based on these very important three aspects, peace, prosperity, and sustainability of these two countries. Now, peace is a very important aspect. You might sometimes see in India, uh, peace is disrupted. Uh, lots of things happen, which makes India look as if it is not peaceful. But peace is something that we always strive Strategies of peace from Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, the middle path to Gandhi, non-violent movement and Satyagraha. These are very important aspects to defeat the spiritual enemies and the political enemies. And Shakyamuni defeated the spiritual enemy. The pain of and the misery of life outside and inside how to live a good life. That's one of the reasons why Buddhism is coming back, Mahayana Buddhism is coming back in modern times. Gandhi, who could defeat the most powerful empire in the world without firing a bullet? Ahimsa and Satyagraha. These were fantastic ideas which uh, lots of people adopted and some succeeded. In Africa, people. Nelson Mandela, for that matter. <clears throat> Prosperity. India is a developing country and therefore wants to prosper. Uh, what is prosperity? A better standard of living. To get education. To be able to do things that everybody else does. Japan got destroyed in the Second World War. Similarly, it was very keen to develop. Infrastructure was destroyed, economy was destroyed. So Japan took a loan from the IMF, from the World Bank, a kind of soft loan which it returned. And that is the policy or the, or the conception of the ODA, that you take a soft loan and you build your infrastructure and you return the money as and when you can. <coughs> Japan could develop at a breakneck speed and that is one of the areas of admiration by Indian politicians and scholars. They said, wow, Japan can do it. And it, there was also a kind of envy that how come Japan could, could develop and succeed so quickly? We cannot. And some tried to wish it away by saying that, look, oh yeah, they are a small country, a little small the population is not big take a look at us but but these everybody knew were excuses the real point was that japan was seen as a great symbol of progress of modernization also both japan and india <coughs> share democratic values apart from The spiritual heritage. They share democratic values, rule of law, and pluralism. So, democracy is a very cherished value. And in spite of this huge country with so much of illiteracy, which is changing, India continues to be a democratic country. It's a great experiment and it's a great promise. Japan values this kind of connection with, 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 with India. Also, Japan has faced lots of calamities. 
the tsunami, earth disaster, volcanic eruptions, and now we have COVID-19, which everybody is facing very courageously. When in India we see Japan fighting these disasters with equanimity, with courage, with resilience and dignity, we feel very proud. We want to connect with Japan. India has always been devastated by foreign conflicts, famine and starvation. We also have a resilience. We can also manage to live. Today in Delhi, <coughs> the governor, the chief minister, is feeding half the population of Delhi every day during this lockdown period. Breakfast and dinner. That's a huge thing to happen. One of the biggest experiments. If you get breakfast, if you get dinner, you can manage your life. You can live in this period of lockdown. In India, lockdown means lockdown. You go out, uh, police will catch you. Japan hasn't gone into lockdown, but an emergency, a self-willed, self-imposed lockdown. So we, we have admiration for each other. Japan requires a huge country like India that can move relentlessly towards a better future with all the problems. So this is the first point I would like to discuss. There are many issues in it, but that will take a long time. And I'm also keeping an eye on the, on the clock that I don't overshoot and don't bore you to death in the first class. The second is the connection between the two countries. Which come back, which 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 go into the very distant past from the sixth century to the eighth century. In the intervening years, the centuries after the eighth, not much happened, or we don't know if much had happened. It's up to the scholars to investigate and find out. So the connection was very strong between India and Japan in the sixteenth, seventeenth, the twentieth, undoubtedly and recently in the 21st century, which is just kind of moving along. And different kinds of people have come, evangelists and scholars, merchants, political rebels, IT professionals, businessmen, people who worked in the restaurants, restaurants. All these people have come, and I know a lot of them, and it is very difficult to put everything together in one lecture. But nevertheless, you have people in Kobe who are uh, merchants and traders and Yokohama uh, merchants and traders in the Indian community coming from Sindh, uh, erstwhile Pakistan, and erstwhile uh, Greater India, and now Pakistan, Bombay, and Latecomers who come from all parts of India to, to Tokyo as the IT professional who are the privileged lot. The early 19th century, you have people, the Parsis and the Punjabis and the Gujarati and the Sindhis and the Bengalis, different parts of India they are coming from uh, and creating a mosaic of uh, culture in terms of food dress, language, uh, religious beliefs and thoughts and so on. So some of them are there and one can meet them. They are very interesting people. For example, Chandru Advani, who recently, a couple of years ago, I think two years ago, passed away. Uh, he was one of the leaders of Yokohama uh, Merchant Association. <coughs> And I worked with him, interviewed, with, interviewed him a couple of times. And he, he was a very fascinating man. Uh, a, 
kind of leader of his community, a person who could connect India and Japan. And he was a person who thought about the future of this partnership. And he was giving lectures, doing a lot of things, even when his health was not so good. He, he worked very sincerely. And he always remembered the place he came from, the past, the refugee background, the difficulties that he faced in Japan, and how he, with courage and alacrity, was able to overcome them. So whenever I met him, I felt very encouraged talking to him. <clears throat> But there is another connection, the age-old connection for 1,200 years of uh, Hindu thought, a priest coming in from different parts of South India and North India. <clears throat> and uh, some of it is lost, but some of the more uh, popular, some of the more grand connections still remain. We have the story of the Indian monk from Brahmin Hindu called Bodhisena, who is a very good example of bringing Indian ancient culture to Japan. In fact, he came here to spread, uh, to teach Sanskrit and to spread Buddhism. So, a lot of the values that he brought became a part of the Japanese tradition. I visited Nara and to trace this journey of a couple of years ago, trace the journey of Bodhisena. And there is a lot of Bodhisena in Nara. And he's still alive in the sense of memory, in the sense of monument, in the sense of his grave being there. some statues. I mean, there is a presence of Bodhisena, if even after a thousand years. And that is really fascinating. So, many of the, I would say that the impact, impact of uh, Buddhism, impact of Bodhisena, uh, has been profound on Japanese tradition. Later on, when we study some of the Japanese words that come from Sanskrit into Japanese, you would be very pleasantly surprised that words like Danna-sama or Kichijoji or Kannon are originally from Sanskrit. So when we study these words, we will understand the significance of the impact of Sanskrit on the Japanese language. So Bodhisena is a, is a fascinating gentleman. He came to Todaiji Temple, he was invited by Emperor Shomu to open the eyes of the great Buddha <coughs> statue. Opening of the eyes is a very interesting ceremony. You, you put the energy, the different kinds of energy, the mental, the spiritual, the Bhakti, the Kriya, all these energies you put into a metal, into something which is activated, which acquires a kind of your power and <clears throat> begins to work for the people. So, with a huge long brush, Bodhisena painted the eyes of the Buddha. Massive Buddha statue. And he imbued power in it. Now, this later on evolved into this great Japanese tradition of Daruma. You have a doll that you buy, and if you fulfill one desire, you make one eye. And then, if you fulfill another desire, you make another. Paint, make 
So the Todaiji temple was destroyed in fire. The Buddha color and paint got burned. So it was kind of uh, retouched, remade. A new brush was made, which you can see here. A huge long brush, which was actually made to open the eyes of Buddha one more time. So the openings of opening of the eye ceremony is a very important ceremony which is conducted over many things even today in Japan. And that comes from, from India. So the internalized essence of India's message, a message of brotherhood, of love, of friendship, to help everyone. Because the, in the Sanskrit tradition, the world is seen as a big family. So to see the world as an extension of the self is a very important in Indian thought. And you have many scholars, uh, Obodashi and from Zen, Zen Suji temple, who visited India to find the essence of Indian thought. <clears throat> These days I'm working for the last couple of years, I'm working on Geisha in Hachioji. The Geishas are professional entertainers to take care of people and customers and uh, <clears throat> I wrote a couple of articles which you can see online in Japan Spotlight and uh, <clears throat> so I was talking to <clears throat> the senior geisha Megumi and she said you know there was a tea ceremony a short while ago and later on I met the uh, master of the tea ceremony <clears throat> so they she said <clears throat> that when a guest comes to meet them, they burn some incense depending on the character of that person. The person is emotional or the person is artistic or the person is warrior-like. People who are artistic, they would use sandalwood. It's a fragrant used in India. So I told her that you know, sandalwood <coughs> is a very important wood and that is used. It is kind of rubbed on stone with water and you make a paste out of it and you put it as a tikka, as a mark on the center of the forehead, not only to cool you, but also to open your wisdom, to open your eyes, to understand the wisdom of different saints and sages of the past. <clears throat> Mothers put a chandan tika on the forehead of their, you know, studying children so that they get wisdom and the eye will open. The th third eye, as it is called, will open uh, to understand what they are studying. So the chandan is very important. So she said, Oh, sorry, we must have destroyed a lot of Indian sandalwood trees from India in the past. And Gomena side. I said, no, no, that is not how it is. But uh, undoubtedly, this statement meant that she immediately saw a connection between India and Japan. So you see when you go to Nara or <coughs> to Kyoto, you would see a beautiful temple. Is, uh, which is set amid, in a forest of camphor trees or uh, trees which are fragrant and you, you feel a, a lot of water is flowing, a sense of well-being and calmness that you would never see in a, a big, big city. And so Obadashi traveled to China and took his text from India and he brought them back technique of textile manufacture and shibori or tie and dye which still continues in Delhi or calico, sarsa all these things come from Urissa from different parts of India. The cultural interflow was tremendous uh, I once visited a place which is about 600 years old which manufactures uh, the ambi print, ambi means the mango print on shika, the deer skin, 
make an impact. Sometimes you might have seen this uh, small boxes or you know, ladies' purses are made out of this. <clears throat> and it comes from India. They have been able to maintain that tradition. Even the designs are so very typically Indian when you find the changes. So some of this has been lost and if you one investigates, it is possible to bring it back. And sometimes you might wonder, how come if there was such a great, how uh, in, in the history and in the flow of time it is lost? I think it is more to do with the Meiji uh, era when Japan started looking towards the West to modernize and to do away with a lot of things that it felt at that time didn't mean a thing. And so this kind of cultural cleaning up and throwing away the katazuke or the, the big cleaning happens. And in the process, some good things are also thrown away and lost. And now we want to bring them back. Said, where, where did they go? So you, you do see a great flow between India and Japan over the centuries. And we are pulling out a few things from here and there. There's no, no clear, you know, timeline narrative. When you lose things, this is how they come back. So a lot of work is needed. Maybe some of you might like to work and bring out some of these stories which are lost, hiding somewhere. So... There's a phone call and we we'll talk about it. But we continue. So we have uh, the <clears throat> Indian story of men like Francis Xavier, Xavier. So he was a Spanish missionary, as you must have read. He came <clears throat> to the west coast of India and he established a center in Goa. Goa was occupied by the Portuguese. It was called the Lisbon of the East. And Till very recently, his body, Xavier's body is still there, encased in glass. And once a year it is brought out. And earlier it wasn't in glass and it was kept in the open and people would touch something and uh, part of his body or the cloth and they would be healed. So millions of people came. But there was once an accident that some woman who was a little, you know, mentally disturbed bit the year, one of the year of Zafia. <clears throat> and it started bleeding. So after that, it was all covered in glass and the body is brought and you can touch the glass. So this is a fascinating story. And you might believe or disbelieve, I don't know, but uh, uh, this is a story that we all hear and I haven't investigated it, but it does show the enormous connection, the spiritual connection between, between India <coughs> and Japan. So much so that Christianity was brought in, I will talk about that a little later, <coughs> but uh, I don't want to fail to mention this, that the Indian merchants who came by ship, <coughs> Indian sailors, not merchants, but sailors who came by ship, they brought Christianity and in Japan, for a long time it was felt that Christianity was an Indian religion. When in India, Christianity is seen as a foreign religion, that it originated outside. So many of these missionaries and traders, they traveled to Miyazaki and Kokoshima, Kagoshima and different prefectures. And um, you have the Spanish and the Dutch and the English traders uh, from these bases in India. And they, they all connected to each other. And uh, during the British Empire, there was a big colony in Rangoon, Burma at that time, Myanmar of Japanese uh, ladies who ran away and uh, merchants and so on. And they were seen later on shifting to Goa in India. And from Goa, they later went to Bombay. And their quarters were seen quite clean and nice. And 
there are some some postcards which the British officers sent to their parents, which are now in the British archives. And one of the letters I read mentioned that uh, this English officer said that I visited their quarters in Bombay and they live very nicely and it is very clean and very nice. <clears throat> this kind of work can be done. I don't think much has been done in this area. So Bodhisena, Bodhisena is, is uh, not only Xavier, but Bodhisena is a very important uh, person who came to Nara that you have already read. Um, but the point I want to make that he saw himself as a reincarnation of Manjushri, a reincarnation to be born with the memory and with the knowledge of somebody else in the past, and that you share that memory and knowledge in the present. This is something very exciting and very interesting in the Indian tradition. Reincarnation, um, as an avatar, as uh, and the word avatar is also <coughs> very much Japanese, has been uh, taken from the Sanskrit tradition. Avatar is also now English, and he saw himself as an avatar, as a reincarnation, had a mission in in in, in Japan. He felt. There was a mission that he had in Japan and that he would, would, would like to fulfill that mission. So when he came to Nara, he started teaching Sanskrit. And as you can see, the impact of Sanskrit on Japanese language. Mm, he was, as a monk, he was taken to the emperor. The emperor was a very important person to, to talk to and to be able to, to, to meet. So Bodhisena stayed in Nara. And he conducted the consecration ceremony for this bronze statue, Varaichona, and then Buddha statue, Kodaiji. <clears throat> he was buried in Ryoju Sen temple. And Ryoju Sen in Nara is a little away from the touristy places of Nara people. Who buses don't go. So I took a taxi and I went there. And when I went there, there were two monks who were sitting and I looked Indian, they saw me and they both got up and they came to me and they said, you are looking for, uh, you want to visit uh, Bodhisena's grave? I said, yeah. He said, we will take you there. This little uphill. And he was talking to me. <clears throat> and he says, you know, now there is a renewed friendship between Japan and India. I said, yeah, that is true. And he says, this era is coming back for Bodhisena after 1,200 years. I said, why do you say that? He says, because I think that this, this place which has been neglected will become a huge temple. And Bodhisena will be in the center. So his work, we have not forgotten. We have not forgotten him. So I was very touched with that and he came back. He says, usually people don't come here, but those who come, they know why they are coming here. <clears throat> so he gave me one or two pictures and photographs. And then I had kept the taxi waiting, so I came back. It was a very interesting visit, and it kind of showed that connections in far-off places between India and Japan still exist. The intercourse, the direction, the interaction between Hindus and foreign Buddhists still exist. And so, the entry of, of Buddhism into Japan was, was a direct outcome of this interaction, this human interaction between India and Japan. And so, the old sects, which were kind of quite, you know, unchallenging, living a staid kind of existence, suddenly got energized new conceptions and ideas. And one of very interesting conception that Buddhism is a light, makes your life a little lighter. Hinduism is a little dark and heavy in that sense. Why do I say that? Buddhism believes that karma can be changed and that you can transform, make it a little light what is called lessening karmic retribution. 
So if you were supposed to die of something, you would be sick of something. But more than that, it gave hope to people that not just a few people could attain enlightenment, but that everybody could. Hinduism did not allow women, did not allow lower caste people to realize anything. And the other thing about the ancient Hindu thought was the belief in dharma. Dharma, <coughs> what is dharma? Dharma meant <coughs> both my character and my duty. So if it is my duty and if it is my character to take care of my family, to do my job and so on, there is no excitement in life. Desires are not there. Don't have desires because you just fulfill your mission on this earth. <clears throat> In a sense, it is very good you don't chase desires and that you live your life. How can dharma be both character and duty? <clears throat> There's a story of an ancient story in India that an ascetic was sitting on the mountain in the Himalayas and the Gangotri river was flowing very fast. So he saw a scorpion, he's trying to climb the rock and it would fall down in the water in the corner. So he picked up the scorpion and put him on the rock. <clears throat> In the process of picking up, the scorpion bit him. Again, the scorpion fell into the water. Again, he picked him up and again, the scorpion bit him. So there was a man sitting across the other side of the shore and he said to him, Jesus, are you, are you so foolish that you are picking up a scorpion? Each time you pick him up, he bites you. He says, no. <clears throat> he says, it is the dharma of the scorpion to bite me. It is my dharma to pick him up and put him there. So he is distinguishing between character of a scorpion and the duty, his own duty. So dharma is both duty and scorpion and duty and <clears throat> instinct. And character. It is the character of the scorpion to bite him, and it is his duty to pick him up and put him back. So, when Buddhism came, <clears throat> it removed the shadow of the dark world and it gave hope to everybody can be happy, everybody can pursue some of his desires and realize them. It had its own problems, but so Buddhist thought enters Hinduism and Hindu thought tries to transform. There are traces of Hinduism in notions of karma. <laughs> Hindus think that karma cannot be changed. Buddhists think, no, it can be lessened. The pain and the problem of the bad karma can be lessened. New one can be developed. <laughs> So Sanskrit and the Japanese traditional court, dance, the music, all are influenced in some measure. You need to work on it by the Buddhist and the Hindu thought. But the strongest influence was on the Hiragana syllabary. Some of the, the way the language is constructed, it is very easy if you know Hindi and Sanskrit to be able to learn Japanese. The way the verb comes in the end is also very Indian and Sanskrit, <coughs> introduced by Bodhisena. We are going a little bit slow, <coughs> so let's speed it up and then we come to the Nalanda University, which was a very important university uh, and it has come back again, where Buddhist analytics and 
scientific methods were employed to understand the world. So India figured in the Japanese imagination, just as Japan figured recently in the Indian imagination. So there are a lot of intellectuals and artists and poets and writers who visited Japan. And a lot of Japanese writers and artists and sculptors and poets visited India, seeking India. So India was called in ancient Japanese Tenjiku or heavenly abode. It was a heavenly place for Japanese to go and visit. <clears throat> so these were the, the stereotypes of India. I mean, this is a very early period later on uh, when, when, when the colonial people like French and Dutch and British came. And before that, India was seen as a land of uh, riches of, uh, you know, jewels and gems and so on. And then they came to India and the whole iconography, beliefs and the understanding of India changed. It was seen as a land of sickness and disease and, and then it changed again into a poor country and in Japan when it gets <coughs> India into its thought in modern times, it is curry rice and poor country. And then you see the 21st century, the, all this change is 20 by 20 and IT, mathematics and information technology. So these changes are very much there, but the connection seems to be very strong. Waxes mm, and wanes, but it is there. So the knowledge of Japan ran deep within the Indian imagination. And there are a lot of early Indians who, especially Indian Portuguese, who like Firoz, uh, Horamsti Dastur. Dastur is a very common name in India. Uh, and he came and he is buried in a cemetery in Yokohama. So there are lots and lots of people who interacted. And during the Meiji, when Japan began to modernize its trading sea routes, you have the shipping company called Nippon Yusen. Nippon Yusen, the ship that traveled in the beginning to India, uh, was destroyed in the war, Second World War, and, <clears throat> and uh, but I could find the photograph, I just couldn't locate it this time, but maybe later on I'll show it to you. They sent it to me, they had a copy of the photograph of uh, the Nippon Yusen ship that traveled between Yokohama and Bombay <clears throat> in the early first runs on which Indian workers and traders uh, came to came to Japan for the first time in the modern history. So in that movement, I would like to talk about Abdul Kaza. I met his uh, grandchildren at a ceremony in Tokyo Temple uh, for Subhash Chandra Bose, that we will come later. His, his ashes are still here in Tokyo. <coughs> And I met the grandparents, the grandchildren. Very interesting. So he was a, a Sunni Muslim from Madras, now called Chennai, in South India. And he came as a teenager working on the ship's deck. He, in fact, hid in the ship's deck. And he came and he was discovered by the captain who employed him. And uh, he came to Japan on. Uh, Few years later, he came again because he was so fascinated by the people, by the country, by the greenery, by the beauty of uh, nature. <coughs> that was he saw in Japan. He decided that he would come back again as he grew up. So a few years later, he returned to Japan on the ship called Empress Queen Victoria. And he worked with the Kumazawa family. And he was called Kumazawa Impressu. As he came on the Empress Victoria. So it's a corruption of the word Empress. Impressu. So he worked with the Koto Kumazawa and he had many children. And, uh, <clears throat> many people came after Kumazawa. Kaza is very interesting because he became Japanese literally 
he used to wear kimono and he used to, you know, sit in that seiza position with the neck stick tucked under. And he did a lot for the Indian community and the Japanese community. When we talk later on about people, we would discuss him as well. So you have another Japanese gentleman, Tada Moto. <clears throat> Moto. Uh, he he was a very interested Motokami. Eh? Sorry, Tada Moto Kichi, Kichi Kichi. And he went in search of the black tea and he brought black tea to Shizuoka. Shizuoka is along the around the mountain on Fuji. And it's a very interesting place. A lot of things grow there and Shikimi grows there. Many other things. And then uh, Tata, uh, Jamshed uh, Tata, whose trucks and he was a great industrialist and buses uh, fly in, in, in India. And he came, he stopped by Japan and he, he, he saw with amazement the way Japan had industrialized itself. So industries were growing. And, uh, Vivekananda who came, uh, who saw the piety the cleanliness and the patriotism of the Japanese people. And you still have the Vivekanan temple here and, you know, lots of people are there. Tagore came, Rabindranath Tagore, who was a writer and poet. And he was fascinated. He liked and disliked Japan. He liked the culture, the sweetness of Japan. And he was not very happy with the rising tide of nationalism in Japan. So he had very mixed kind of feelings. And then we discussed about Tagore later on. We would talk about it. He built uh, two universities, uh, Shantiniketan and Vishwabharati universities, and that has become a great center of contact for Japanese and Indian intellectuals and artists and, and so on. <coughs> silk is very interesting, and silk merchants. I talked to some of the old silk merchants, and they were telling me, and some of the Japanese who interacted with the Indian silk merchants, and he said that the Indian uh, traders, they had two very wonderful qualities. One, they were very prompt in returning the payment, the money. And the second, they had a vast network of business relationships, which was very useful. He says Japanese used both. And sometimes when we wanted to borrow money, they had the money to give us. So they were always well prepared. And during the great Kanto earthquake that happened in 19. 28 Indian silk merchants lost their lives and there's a memorial that is created in mm, Nippon Nippon Odori in near Yokohama <coughs> called in the, in the Yamashita Park uh, which uh, kind of pays homage to these 28 Indians who died and every year there's a ceremony so I used to go Chandru Admani when he was alive in my to visit them. No, we would remember them. So a whole lot of Indian trading community grew by the turn of the 20th century. <coughs> Yokohama and Kobe and other places. And <coughs> all the, we, we have the 1903, we have the Japan India Association, which builds up the economic bilateral friendship and partnership, you can call it, between the two, two countries. <coughs> Japan became an economic superpower and that is fascinating. But beyond that is Japan defeating Russia in 1904. And that was a great hope. When this news traveled to India, Indians began to hope that if Japan, an Asian country, could defeat Russia, Europe, why not India defeat Great Britain? So there was a lot of hope that it was possible. <coughs> a lot of people from, from Japan, like Takeda, Chandrapabha Takeda, she was an Indian lady who married a Japanese in what was called Bangladesh, uh, what is called Bangladesh now, but that time it was Dhaka, part of the greater India and part of the greater Bengal. So she visited Japan as a married woman and she met her in she 
documented a lot of things about <coughs> about India, about Japan, and it was published uh, in Bengali, and a lot of people are working on it at the moment. Uh, I have some documents, not complete, to talk about her, but yes, I do have. So Takeda is another, Majumdar is. Another. There are lots of people. And after the Second World War, a lot of Indians felt that uh, they should be on the side of Japan. So Japan had done a lot of things. So there was a feeling in, in India. India, uh, But before that Japanese victory over Europe, uh, I want to talk about one more point, which I forgot. <clears throat> that when this news about Japanese victory over Russia came to India, the, the Congress Party, Indian National Congress Party, was split in two parts. One part felt that they should pursue the constitutional method of gaining victory and not the violent. On the other hand, Subhash Chandbose, all these uh, people later on, began to see that a military path was, was preferable. But anyway, those things changed. That's a part of history. And after the Second World War, after the defeat of, uh, of uh, Japan and the indictment of various people who participated in the war, Nehru refused to sign the San Francisco Treaty. And he says it offended the dignity of Japan. And Radha Vinod Pal, who was part of the uh, San Francisco Treaty as a judge, he refused. He was the only one who is, who, who dissented <coughs> to indict. Uh, and he his judgment, uh, not guilty, was very much appreciated. He said, I want a fair, a fair trial. And this is, his dissent was, it was not a fair, fair trial. So Nehru and Radha Binod Pal were very interested in the kind of justice that Japan got and Nehru provided after the war a lot of iron ore uh, to exporters in Japan because it was required for building up the industry. And as you know, during the war, most of the animals were poisoned or they died of starvation and hunger. So the zoo, you know, Ueno Zoo had nothing left. So they gave two elephants um, to the park and that was very much appreciated by Japanese who felt a kind of a ray of hope in going to the park and enjoying <coughs> the animals and so India was very much on the mind of, of Japanese Japanese people after the war and um, so the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal very interesting. If you go to Yaskuni Shrine, you would see uh, stone kind of plaque mentioning the contribution of Radha Pino. And when Shinzo Abe visited Calcutta, he met the grandchildren, the family of Pino Pal, and he said thank you to them for the kind of way they responded to Japan's defeat. <coughs> so both Japan and India, <coughs> they are moving towards a bipolar world, military, cultural and economic creation and influence. What is a bipolar? More than two partners. So Japan, India feels and Japan feels that uh, one or two people are not the right way to run the world. There is always bitterness and dissension and conflict. So if there are more than two, it's a it's a multipolar world, it's better. So they are not thinking of a bipolar but a multipolar world where military, cultural and economic influence is equally shared by a couple of nations who can do good things to the world and who can maintain a check on each other. Uh, so I talked about Radha Binod Pal and we are running beyond one hour. I think you are tired and I don't want to talk a lot about Rashbihari Bose and 
But yes, uh, Rush Bihari Bose again was running away from the British and the, the Scotland Yard was after him. He came to Japan and he <clears throat> uh, went into the Nakamuraya family merchants who were running the business of uh, bakery. Even today, if you go to Shinjuku, you will find Nakamuraya. So he married their daughter and he became a Japanese citizen and he contributed effectively to Japan. And his, I met his granddaughter Tetsuki, Tets, Tetsuko Higuchi and she wrote a book uh, how she, he is forgotten. I think the reason why people don't remember Radha, Rashbi Haribos is because he became a Japanese citizen. And the second reason is that Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose was seen as more important. Raj Bihari was neglected. And lastly, because Japan lost the war and whatever contribution he made in Japan was also lost. He's a very important person and he's a very interesting guy. So I think some of you might like to work and investigate a lot of material that I can give you. The other guy is Nair, who has a Nair restaurant in Ginsa in India. He also suffers from the same neglect. He also was part of the revolution, part of the tradition of cuisine and food. But his life is not as dramatic and as colorful as uh, Rash Bihari Bose. And so he's also kind of lost in this whole process of, you know, shifting contours of, of uh, in Indo-Japan relations. So a multipolar, multilateral diplomacy. So basically, I would like to conclude by saying that India and Japan are natural partners because they have sought each other in different worlds, in the realm, the spiritual and the economic, the political, the educational, the strategic and bilateral. And it is a very interesting subject to study, especially now when things are changing. And we are once more connected, living in a world of digital technology, which connects us, even though we are suffering from this, you know, social distancing and all these things, we still can connect through the internet like we are doing with you. So I would like to suggest that let's work together and learn something in these uh, weeks, in this semester. So once more, be safe and thank you very much for listening to my lecture and I hope you will get something out of it. Uh, do make notes and let us work together for India-Japan partnership and friendship. Thank you very much. That was the first lecture. So if you have any comment or questions. Good afternoon, William Sensei. Good afternoon. Sensei, I would like to know more about Meiji era and what modernize, uh, what they were modernizing in Japan, like what it was and what after Meiji era or in the Meiji era. Uh, the Meiji was a very interesting period of time in in Japan because on the one hand, Japan was uh, modernizing and getting things from from Europe and America. And what was the nature of that modernization? Uh, one that they wanted to create a civilization which was, which was complete. There was a general understanding that uh, European civilization was complete and that Japanese was incomplete and Indian was a broken civilization. That was the... So these, with these misconceptions, Japan wanted to modernize at a great speed. And Fukuzawa Yukichi, who set up Keio University, mentioned that uh, science and reason was very important to bring in as part of the modernizing process. <clears throat> the second thing he wanted was that uh, Japanese should people should have their own opinion, what is called individuality. So these two were missing and they had already imported a lot of things in terms of technology and various other things. But the scientific temper and individual opinion were very much sought after. And that is one of the reasons why you have Keio University that was set up called Keio Gichiku. 
by Fukuzawa Yukichi. And the first thing that you see in Keo, the main campus in Mita, where I also teach, uh, is the debating hall. So the first thing he made was the debating hall uh, so that students could express their opinions clearly. So this was the hallmark of education. And even until today, we struggle sometimes with this fact that why don't you uh, share your opinion? And I don't think that we should kind of impose that Western kind of standard which they were doing at that time, because Japan is a very different society. The whole conception of the Confucian values, the group thinking, and where the individual does not come as important. So these are highly debated by a very Western kind of, you know, audience. But I think it has enormous value in terms of keeping a system alive, ishin deshin, uh, to understand without saying anything. So these are the unique qualities which I think a lot of the Meiji reformers felt that they ought to go. Like Indian reformers, like Raja Ram Mohan Roy, wanted many things to go. The 19th century was a period of this kind of thought. The big difference between India and Japan was that in India, modernity was imposed through the English language and the setting up of four universities in, in India, Calcutta, Bombay, Madras, Delhi. But in Japan, it was sought. People went out to Europe and America to, to, to acquire and get. So there was, uh, if, if you feel that something is imposed, you rebel and you don't want it. So that kind of thinking was very much in India and continues to be what is called hyper-rationalism today, that on the one hand, we have uh, reason and rationality and the scientific temper. On the other hand, we have religion, a strong religious identity, which didn't, didn't go away. In Japan, that kind of thing doesn't exist uh, in a very small level, you know. I mean, it is religion is not the central focus of identity in Japan. So the Meiji's uh, response to modernity it was very different. In fact, to give you a good example, a lot of a lot of Japanese writers, they brought the idea of individualism into Japan through the process of modernity. But when it came here, they went against modernity, against individualism. And what we call exist is a broken individualism. Natsume Soseki and... Tani, Tanizaki, Junichiro, and Okada, and all kinds of people. So basically, Japan couldn't do away with the, with the culture that existed. And, and there wasn't any great reason to do so except the catching up. The catching up was very important. And uh, so you, you, you can see there are lots of things that we can talk about. The, the ambivalence in, in in Japan of uh, modern thinkers who, who on the one hand wanted modernity, on the other hand disliked it. So there are a lot of metaphors in it, so I don't want to give details, but does it help? Okay. okay. Thank you, Sensei. Anybody else? Can I? Yes. Ah, yes, Benoit. Go ahead. So thank you for today. Sorry, I came a little late, so I didn't like see the whole video. Uh, yes, it was very interesting with this, what I listened to. And uh, you talk right now about uh, broken individualism. Ah, yes, yes, yes. It yes, yes. uh, was imported into Japan. And it wasn't imported. Individualism was imported. It became broken when it came to Japan. Oh, okay. So could you explain why it was broken? and? Uh, like okay, okay. More, more in details. Now, what in what sense it was spoken? Okay. <clears throat> now uh, Natsume Soseki wrote Kokoro. That is supposed to be an iconic work. So people who come to Japan, they are advised: please read Kokoro. Heart. What is the Japanese heart? And lots of young people will say, no, this is an old man talking and Oji-chan, we don't like to listen to him. But uh, nevertheless, it is quite iconic. 
in this there is a sensei who instead of expressing his identity closes himself down and finally commits suicide because he doesn't want to offend somebody so uh, if you are worried about offending somebody or the group uh, where is self actualization which is one of the very important components of individuality or individualism something to that effect like uh, anna karenina by tolstoy when modernity entered uh, russia anna karenina is seen as a modern novel however ann rand says that this is the most evil novel because how can a writer not allow a woman to actualize her life to realize her potential it is supposed to be a very evil work but all these writers mm-hmm. that i have mentioned to you were trying to bring in the individual in the novel i but the i couldn't express himself positively so it was called in japan a broken individualism make sense yes thank you very much yeah Uh, yeah yeah sir i would like to ask uh, you talked about the mixed feelings of rabindranath tagore regarding japan oh yes 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 uh, that yes. he disliked the nationalism in japan uh, so i i was curious that if rabindranath tagore ever went to japan did he leave some legacy of his writing skills that were adopted in a book or or in some literary works yeah 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 rabindranath tagore came many times to japan and he loved japan he loved the birds and the mountains and the way the beauty of japan was expressed and he he wrote a lot of poems first but then what happened he he went to sankian uh, gardens and he stayed there and he he saw the beauty and he says this is how it used to be and this is must be how it was so as a poet as a poet's mind was definitely fascinated by the beauty of japan and he came many times but as japanese nationalism was rising especially noguchi who was a student of keio university seemed to think that uh controlling china what is called manchuria was a great idea to bring in um a kind of a national order in the world that was a kind of thinking tagore thought otherwise so much so noguchi wrote a couple of articles in indian newspapers i think amrit bazar patrika and something else and he he tried to explain to uh, to tagore and various other people that this was the right way to do but it had a very negative impact tagore on the other hand uh, when he came to japan he gave a lecture at keio university on nationalism it is available online you can you can download free as a pdf file um, on nationalism he spoke in in osaka he spoke spoke in tokyo and he spoke uh, at uh, at uh, keio university was called keio gijuku this this lecture was in english and as you know at that time people didn't understand very much of english so but it was so critical of the japanese system that the newspaper did not translate it into japanese because they didn't want people to read this kind of thing so he said that western civilization at heart is very cruel it wants to use people nationalism and militarism it wants to use people in the service of the nation according to him as a humanist he felt that the human being was very important now some of his writings which are collected as complete works of the goal i think if you take them out and publish in the newspaper he'll be put in prison if he was alive he is so so very strong about this point that now we have a fervent nationalism but he was so strong that look if you sacrifice the individual for the nation this is something evil and this was misunderstood in japan and the the kind of bitterness that it created 
with the Japanese nationalists who turned militaristic. And you know the whole story, what happened. And Nair was also in the center who runs the, uh, you know. And um, so all these people who were anti-nationalist sentiment using the individual for, uh, in, you know, personal gains was something that Tagore didn't like. And, and he, he got, he kind of moved away from all these people who were so lovely friends for him and who brought them, brought him to, to, to Japan. So he became very bitter. In fact, he wrote a letter to C.F. Andrews, who was the principal of St. Stephen's College at that time, that I have decided never to come to Japan again. And next year he came, 1926. You see? So there was an ambivalence. I have decided never to go because of this. But he loved Japan so much that he came back. So th th this is the story of, uh, the, uh, of Rabin Tagore. Thank you so much. Oh. Anybody else? Uh, yes, Ashima. Yes, Ashima. Hi. Uh, sir, thank you for your wonderful ideas. They were really nice to uh, listen to. And uh, yesterday we were discussing with Teramoto Sensei in, uh, in another session uh, about the makeup culture in Japan. I and Priyanka san were discussing about it. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think about it? Do you think it uh, it sort of you know um, how do you say it? It uh, strengthens the idea that women are just you know for uh, glamour sort of purposes in the society. And you know it mm. kind of it kind of uh, lessens their importance in the society. So, what are your views on the gender discrimination in Japan? Because uh, from what we have heard or seen in at least movies and internet and through other sources, is that I think uh, gender inequality in Japan is a little higher than in India. Mm. Mm. Although the image that Japan projects is like completely different, um, but the reality, I think, is a little bit off. Yes, I, I fully agree with what you are saying. <clears throat> but there are two questions that you have. One is about uh, uh, beauty, people making themselves, women making themselves beautiful. When you were talking, I felt that these days there's a new trend that men ought to make themselves good looking. That's a new there trend. That too. Oh, yes, yes, yes how to remove hair from the body and all that and how to look nice and how to wear good uh, things so that you become, you know, attractive. So it's not only, only women. And the other thing is, there are lots of these small magazines in Japan that give you a trend. So after six months, this is what you should do and wear. This is how you should dress. So people do follow because there is a group idea of what is beauty. The individual notion of beauty, which perhaps exists in other parts of the world, is not appreciated so much here. So the idea of cuteness, not sexiness, is very important. So when the dresses are there and certain styles come in, so people, when you follow a kind of a trend which comes and changes, it's easier to manage because you don't worry too much what is your trend now after six months. So a lot of girls feel very comfortable about this, that, you know, I mean, we know exactly where to go, how to shop and what to buy and what to do. This is one point. Men are also doing that quite a bit now. It is, it is on the increase. But over and above, I think it is a dress culture. Uh, in India, people don't bother so much about how they dress. But in Japan, yeah. it is a very important aspect. Even, for example, two places uh, in Keio University, we have two campuses. The main campus, which is, uh, which is uh, Mita campus, where Tagore gave a lecture, which is very old. And the new campus that it came in 1990s called SFC, Shonan Fujisawa campus. Now, Keio Mita you have to be formally dressed when you go to teach in a suit and a tie. But SFC, you don't need to go in a suit or a tie within the same, uh, you know, same university, but different prefectures. Keio Mita is in, in Tokyo and SFC Shonan Fujisawa is in Fujisawa. 
So these two places have different lifestyles and dress patterns. So to give you an example, I mean, if you are a professor, you should be dressed up in a suit and a tie. That qualifies you as a professor. But if you wear a jacket or something, you know, you think, people think you are working class. So once it happened to me that I changed at, uh, um, I changed my train at uh, uh, Machida to go to SFC. So in the morning, eight o'clock, I I just wore a jacket which uh, was was an informal jacket, not a regular jacket. So the police stopped me. He says, "Where is your uh, identity card?" And so on. They thought I must I was an illegal worker or somebody. And so I showed uh, him that they were in plain clothes and so on. So. And he turned it around my resident card, and it said professor. So he bowed. He says, "I'm very sorry. Thank you very much for teaching the students of Japan." So the, the, the whole misconception. I said, "You won't find at eight o'clock in the morning, uh, uh, you know, uh, person who's illegal moving around. You would be doing that at eight o'clock at night, not in the morning." Uh, so he said, "Yeah, but our boss said hey, he, he was very. They were very apologetic." So there is a certain certain way of looking at at people. When I go to uh, a government office, I usually wear a tie and wear a proper. Things move very nicely, uh, easily, and so the, the, there is a dress consciousness, which I don't think we have so much in other parts of the world. So, uh, but yes, and the final question about women. Yes, there is a kind of a difference, and uh, but within the framework, feminism uh, and the feminist movement did not strike such deep roots in Japan because a lot of Japanese women also rejected uh, the whole conception of of the individual identity, the politics of feminism, uh, personal is political, uh, that kind of thing, because they feel that they can do many things within the group and at the same time there are certain things that they can't do within a group but the group uh, identity is is very important you see has a lot of things to offer and so it is not and it doesn't sit very well uh, for a lot of people i'm not kind of condoning what is happening at all but uh, it is definitely a very different scenario uh, in japan why the european feminism did not take roots in Japan till today. That's my thought. Sir, do you think it will change in the near future? I don't think so. Because the language is connected to the way people think. And the language is central point of the DNA of Japan, like race is the DNA of America and caste is the DNA of India. So you have to break a country and build it again. It's just false expectation. My also, thing. is it one of the uh, also is it one of the reasons uh, uh, that uh, you know the Japanese way of thinking I think is much more rigid than uh, uh, say no no I, I do not think that oh I see I see Japanese way of thinking is not rigid it is sometimes difficult for other people to understand there is a whole process if you follow the process things work. If you don't follow the process, it looks rigid. And uh, company structure is like this. Uh, you need to need to discuss with each individual first before you have a meeting. You cannot discuss and arrive at a conclusion in a meeting. Nothing will work. First, you have to discuss with each individual who will attend the meeting. L listen to him, and it is called in Japanese nemowashi. And if you don't do that, yeah, nemowashi. Two people will say, no, you never talk to us. And once it is rejected in a meeting, for a couple of three years maybe, uh, you will never find uh, what you want happen again. You will think it is rigid. It is not rigid. I think it is a certain, there's a certain process that you need to follow. And if the process is because people, you see why? Japanese language is connected to emotion. Mm -hmm. And if you say something which goes against somebody or somebody's opinion, it is an insult to him. 
English through the process of deductive logic thesis, antithesis, you come to a synthesis. People like this discussion, strong argument, very passionate, and you arrive at a conclusion. You have a passionate argument in Japanese meeting. It's collapsed completely. So everybody said, yeah, hi, what you say is correct. Very nice. Nobody wants to offend the other person. It doesn't mean they don't have their own opinion. Once things are decided, you don't share your opinion. Whatever opinion you wanted to give, do that beforehand and get things organized. Once everything is done within a meeting, it should be nice and polite and everybody must agree. That's how it is. So if we understand that cultural uh, shift that takes place when you come to Japan, I think things should be okay. Uh, thank you so much, Sensei, for clearing the doubts. Hi. Anybody else? Thank you so much, sir, for the today's lecture. So my question is, um, so you told about the Bodhi, how Bodhi Sena uh, uh, made uh, the uh, made popularize the Buddhism in Japan, but how? But uh, in India, we have know that we know that in uh, the Buddhism, Buddhism is not. Uh, in my majority in India. So what could be the reason that uh, as it is originated in India, it's not, uh, the people does not uh, follow the Buddhism as a religion. Today? Today? Hi, Sensei. Sir, uh, Sensei, in last class, in our uh, yesterday's lecture also, uh, in our lecture, uh, yesterday's seminar, uh, the students of Japan, uh, yes, from the Soka University, they asked me about the same question, but I have, I didn't have the answer. I see, I see. I just want to, yeah, Sensei. You see, uh, when Bodhisena came to Japan, it was 1,300 years ago. That is a very long time. <clears throat> And before that, 2,144 years ago, <clears throat> you have the Bactrian Indian civilization coming from Greece into India. And there was a king called Menander, which is called Malinda in, in, in the Buddhist text. And there was a Buddhist monk called Nagasena. So his empire was in what is Afghanistan and all those areas. And he was a great debater, Menanda. <clears throat> so Menanda debated with Nagasena about many ideas that he had. You can read, you will find. But he asked one question. He says, my king, what kind of debate do you want? You want a debate that happens between a king and a king, a debate that happens between a king and an ordinary citizen, a debate that happens between a scholar and a king. So Menander asked, what is the difference? He said, the difference is this. If it is a debate between a scholar and a king, and the scholar says something that the king doesn't agree to, he can cut his neck. But if it is a debate between a scholar and a scholar, I would like to debate with you. And if you lose, you agree to me. And if I lose, I agree. To he said, yeah, done. Scholar and a scholar. So Menander agreed to everything that Nagasena asked. And he became a Buddhist. Menander became a Buddhist. And he opened a lot of monasteries and he supported. So this was the ethos of over 2,000 years ago. It continued to flourish during the time of Bodhisena. But when you come later on, the rise of Brahmanism, the strong electrifying force of... Rise means it's a word, but you know it was always there. But what did Shakyamuni say? He said, look, everybody can attain enlightenment. People who are intellectuals, people coming from what is called Ichitantrika, and women all can attain, and there is no division or a gap between high and low. This was something disastrous for people who felt that the caste and the 
you know, divisions were very important. So most of the people who joined were basically from the lower caste. They felt there was the ray of hope, you know, that there was there was a light somewhere that, you know, we could achieve. And karma and so on, that it was not just dharam, my dharma, uh, my character or my duty, but it was it was something much more that I can also become happy. Uh, there was some kind of a lightness. There was a darkness of the time was gone. So Buddhism created that, yet at the same time, there was a lot of animosity and dissent and dislike for uh, the kind of people who were entering. So you have in India new Buddhists now, you see, they are identified with a certain section, you know. So uh, you have the Japanese Buddhism coming, which is a different thing, but basically it was seen as equalizing or leveling society in India, which was not a good thing for many people, continues to be till today. The deeper layers of Indian thought uh, construction is that very much, you know, the certain people will not be allowed to, uh, so we have a lot of protest, we have reservation, we have protest, we have, you know, all kinds of things and people complain about it from time to time, but it hasn't changed. And I said in the beginning, it is the DNA of our system. It's kind of rooted within the molecular framework of the nation as it arose, you see. However you may try, uh, when you get into the DNA, it doesn't change, you know. Uh, how long did it take for, uh, for America to get back into all these problems that existed in the 1960s? Race mm, continues to plague. We too. So Buddhism today is not seen as some kind of a mainstream, but as something that if it becomes bigger, it will offer a bigger challenge. At the moment, it is not as big, but if it becomes bigger, it can offer a challenge. So many people maintained or maintain that this is, this is an issue that uh, can we have an equalizing uh, philosophy uh, that can make everything same for everybody. Or we need uh, some people who are privileged, who will be at the top. That's the point. Thank you so much, Sensei, for sharing your views. Thank you so much. Shushant, do you have something to say? I can't hear you. No. Yeah, I have a yeah. question. Yes. Uh, thanks for sharing this. Uh, yeah, last I remember the last time you shared about uh, when we met, you shared about food morality. So can you please like elaborate a bit more? What is that? Food morality. Food morality. What did I say to you? Uh, you said food is not a morality. It's not about morality. Hmm. Uh, you know, and I feel like the individualism. Hmm. It affects when you know uh, a person in an environment try to influence. Yeah, I mean, what I mean is that people talk about vegetarian and non-vegetarian meat eating cultures and non-meat eating cultures. I don't think it is to do with morality. It's to do more with science. We are not constructed. Our digestive system is not constructed to eat meat. And it, it has a problem. You know, you take 72 hours to digest meat at 96.5, whatever, 6 uh, temperature of the body. You keep that meat outside for 72 hours. It takes 72 hours to digest, go through the body. See what happens to it. And now, now everywhere people are talking about the uh, detrimental effects of, uh, you know, and these creatures that we have, that people eat, are very much close to our evolutionary cycle whether they have emotions or not is debatable but a lot of animals who are closer to us have emotions and we are not eating food alone we are eating emotions as well how do you break them down you know uh, certainly you know you you have an animal who is closer to us uh, and you take him to the slaughterhouse it takes eight to twelve days 
from the owner to be released, released from the owner and to be taken to a slaughterhouse. So animals know, these animals know what is going to happen to them. And a lot of them stop eating. If you know some of the people who buy the animals for certain sacrificial purposes, they will tell you that the animals stop eating because they know what is going to happen to them. Now, the emotions that go through, they go through. And those are the emotions which we have to break down apart from the food that we eat. So the, you need to drink coffee, you need to sleep more, you need to drink something else to digest. So it takes a much longer time and it uh, creates all kinds of issues which we don't know. Now they're talking about the connection, depression, loneliness, feeling uh, you know, unhappy. All of these, we don't connect to what we eat, but it is. So I don't think it is to do with morality. It is to do with, with our health and with the scientific ideas of, I think people in India were quite smart to think about uh, a culture which was based on, on you know, vegetables and a very simple diet. They also have feelings and we know that. But the, 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 the further we are in the evolutionary cycle, like in Japan, fish, fish is very much far away in the evolutionary cycle. So I think eating that is a little better than eating some bigger creature who's very close to us in our, uh, you know, evolutionary cycle. So that's why I said that it is not a matter of morality, but a very practical way of living. How do we live? And how do we sensitize ourselves to that life? And with all the problems that people face uh, with eating that kind of food. Uh, but if you kind of develop that kind of taste and a habit, you feel that you can't live without it. That is a big problem. I mean, I need this and I need that. I can't live. Don't tell me. You will find 10 ways to justify what you are looking for. Right. So mm. that, that is a problem, I think. But I think the world is shifting. And uh, I don't know how long it will take for it to shift. Because our sense of time and the sense of time that societies and nations have is very different. But we are. You see the pandemic that is happening. <laughs> it didn't happen through potatoes, you know. So, so that 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 is the thing, and e even those people are now saying that oh, we are not going to eat this, we are not going to eat that, and we're not going to have a dog festival anymore. This is the last one. I hope they they believe what they're saying, but all this is there. So we're beginning to realize what uh, what are the things we will release in the world. On the one hand, the world is coming together. And on the other hand, if you release something, it will immediately spread and affect everyone. Mm. Uh, this phenomena that you see of pandemic today is a big city phenomena. If you didn't have any big cities like Delhi, Bombay, um, New York, Tokyo, you wouldn't have the sickness that we have today. And now people want to run away from these big cities, you know. You can buy property at very cheap rate in places which were so expensive now. Mm. So people's thinking, you know, uh, capitalism couldn't change it. Nothing could change it. But a small, you know, a virus who's neither living nor dead can do that. People are rethinking or have rethought the whole way of life. That's what I think. Uh, sensei? Yeah. Uh, and say, uh, you talked about Geisha Hachiochi, oh, yes. uh, the industry of entertainers in Japan that connect guests to Japan through traditional music and dances. Yes. And say, I also heard about it, but I've only come across women uh, as Geisha uh, entertainers. I would want to know if there are also men in that uh, industry. Look, or, I have never met, I have never met any man. They used to be in Kyoto. A long time ago, a couple of men who were. But this, the way it has evolved, I only read in books and so on. It is not something that I have directly, and I don't think there are very many or hardly any. Uh, so it is to do with the trade and commerce that grew 
uh, in Japan a hundred years ago. So the Hachioji Geisha come because of the silk trade and so on. Um, there were nearly 115 houses at that time, 108 houses at that time in Hachioji. But with the collapse of the trade, Hachioji didn't remain that kind of city anymore. And people didn't have the money, you know, to pay. You need 100,000 yen for four hours of entertainment uh, if the geisha comes with a maiko or a little music and a little talk and a 15,000 yen for, for dinner. So 100, 115,000 yen, uh, that is uh, roughly 90% of the 80% of the salary of many people. So people would not like to spend that kind of money. And so most Japanese families have never even seen, forget about meeting a geisha. And earlier geisha used to go in people's homes celebrating grandmother's birthday or something or, you know, some child is born or just, you know, people who are feeling unhappy, please come. Uh, so things like that. So they, they were known uh, in the neighborhood, in the community. People, they would walk, people would see. Now we're trying to bring that back in Hachioji. So now there are just about 27, 28 geisha left in, in Hachioji and Japanese government wants to bring them back in a new way. Uh, so I think the omotenashi, the idea of, uh, you know, Japanese uh, uh, hospitality, the idea of Japanese hospitality <clears throat> is something that is lost. In Japan, I think the only place that it remains is the geisha community. The only place it remains. So, uh, the, go ahead. Yeah, and Sensei, is this community run by generations and generations? As in, only the successor of a geisha can become another geisha, or anybody can come and join? No, 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 it is not like anybody can. Any one can come. And recently, I met a lot of uh, girls who came uh, to Megumi, this uh, geisha who runs the place. And they were high school students and they wanted to be geisha. Uh, so, Maiko. So, their parents came uh, to meet. So, I was there when the parents came and said, you really want your daughter to become a geisha. And they said, yeah, yeah, it's not something that is forced on you or you pressurize. Da, 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 da. And so... So I listened to the conversation. So it was very interesting. And the one who runs the house today, she was working in a Japanese restaurant uh, at, when she was 21 years old. And at, on that day, her senpai, senior uh, geisha, came to make a performance in that hotel. And she was very much impressed. And she told her father that she wanted to be a geisha. Father said, never talk to me again. So I will support you, but I don't want to be a part of it. So he supported her and his, uh, her mother supported, her sister supported. But uh, before he died, a couple of years ago, the father uh, performed in one of the shows that she was doing and made the stage, uh, wooden stage for her. So his thinking also underwent the change, especially... Uh, when he saw her, she was playing the koto and she played a lot and her fingers started bleeding and there was a lot of blood on the koto. So her father said that you are very serious and changed his, his opinion about. So she is very serious about the art and the profession. So it's not just a job that they do. But it's a whole kind of a way of life. So, that's the point. Uh, Sensei, the same thing I have observed in Rajasthan also. When I was uh, visiting Rajasthan with my family and we were just tour seeing every other places, there were the same people, not not exactly the like the geisha industry, but somewhat similar to it. They performed the traditional Rajasthani folk dances and folk music and they uh, introduced us to the Rajasthani culture by giving us food. There was this whole resort and they played and they prepared everything for us. And I think that that was some sort of a similarity with what uh, I guess Keisha culture is in Japan. 
but mm-hmm, it's, mm-hmm. it's more or less only situated in Rajasthan and other culturally rich states in India. I, guess. I saw, I forgot when you were talking, I forgot that I met one uh, Michael who wants to be a geisha from Romania first time. And she came for two, three minutes when I was talking to the uh, to the um, the tea ceremony uh, sensei. Um, she came briefly, bowed, and, and went away. So I asked who is this? Oh, she's the first time. So they want to change the whole. It was impossible in the past that a foreigner could enter, but I don't know how far it is possible. But I saw this. I just remember that. Thank you, Sensei. Yeah. Thank you. So. Okay, so should we close now since we have like just a few minutes left? Okay. If nobody has any comment or question, I think we shall close. Thank you very much for those wonderful questions and very nice. So please follow some of those ideas and please feel free to send me a message as and when you want. Yes.